Welcome to Bespoken Bones with your host, Parvani More, connecting ancestors, sex, magic, and science. Parvani explores transpersonal tools for erotic wellness every new and full moon, engaging educators, healers, spiritual leaders, and scientists in revolutionary dialogue. Get ready to feel good and go deep. This is Bespoken Bones. Hey there, and welcome to Bespoken Bones, ancestors at the crossroads of sex, magic, and science. We're in the business of healing trauma, connecting to our roots, and developing radiant erotic wellness in past, present, and future generations. I'm your host, Pavani More, and I'm delighted to introduce you today to Kaf and Jesse. Kaffin is a leading somatic sex educator who lives and works on Salt Spring Island in Canada. People from around the world attend her workshops and private classes at her waterfront studio. She is the author of Science for Sexual Happiness, Erotic Massage for Healing and Pleasure and Orientation, Mapping Queer Meanings, plus co-editor of a new anthology on somatic sex education called Healers on the Edge. She teaches an intimacy educator training, plus she co-teaches the certified sex educator and certified sexological body worker trainings for the Somatic Sex Educators Association. And for more information, you can see her website at www.erospirit.ca. That's www.erospirit.ca. Hi, Catherine. Welcome. Hi, Pavni. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Ah, it's such a delight to have you. I'm curious if you would speak a little bit about the work that you do in order to give some context for the interview. Yes, thank you. Well, as you said, I'm a somatic sex educator, so I work with different people on their journeys to sexual wholeness. Often that involves working with people who've experienced trauma and oppression and um, have had a hard time accessing pleasure. And, uh, you know, though I used to work a lot with, with individuals and occasionally with people in partnerships, I now do a lot of teaching. I'm sort of at that point in my life where it's less about the work and more about the web and passing on the work that I've done to to other people. And uh, yeah, so teaching for the Somatic Sex Educators Association and in my own workshops, it feels like... Um, is my main my main focus right now. Yeah, thank you. Would you just talk a little bit about somatics and what it is and why it's important, just to give um, a little bit more info about that? Um, sure. Um, somatics, um, soma is a, a Greek word. It means the living body soul or the living body and its wholeness. So somatics is um, about body-based exercises and experiences emerging from the insight that trauma and the neglect and the oppression that we experience around sex is embodied in our physiology. So it's expressed in, in our heartbeat and our breath and our nervous system and our skin and our access to, to be able to feel pleasure and aliveness around sex. So um, whereas, whereas psychotherapy comes from the idea that uh, understanding more uh, or having cognitive insights into our traumas uh, can help us undo them. Somatics is coming in the other direction that that through changing our bodies, through dialoguing with our autonomic nervous system, through becoming empowered to feel and for actually having new experiences in places where we felt trauma and neglect and oppression, that we can change our minds, that we can change our hearts. And um, so we're undoing the effects of trauma and neglect at the cellular level. So our nervous systems are always changing in response to the environment and to what we do and what we think. So they're going to change in response to, to pleasure and play and somatic practices with the body will actually change the way that we can be in the world. Thank you. What do you think 
is the somatic importance of ancestors? Um, well, I'd say, you know, ancestors are part of our molecular structure, our, our soma, our, our body contains information from stardust and from algae and from the whole evolution of multicellular life. Our DNA is proving our kinship with all life as well as our individuality. So we're a vast store of embodied wisdom that we can tap into through somatics. Um, so that, in that sense, I think of ancestors. And I'd really like to hear from you, Pavani, how you bring in the dimension of ancestral work to your practice as a sex educator. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I think in particular, I am tracking for family history, right? So I'm, when I'm, when I'm doing intake with clients or in kind of the um, earlier parts of our work, what I'm looking for is what are the the familial blessings and burdens that this person experiences around sex. So are there particular beliefs around sex or attitudes that they receive from their family of origin? You know, what degree of openness was present in their family when they were growing up around sex? What degree of shame was present? Are there um, stringent religious practices that were in place that um, might impede the free expression of sexuality. So that's that's one place um, where I'm looking to see kind of the impact of a person's family uh, and familial structure on on their sexuality, as well as I'm asking, is there anything in your ancestry that you know of that might be impacting your sexuality? Is there any sexual violence or sexual trauma in the ancestry that you're aware of? Um, and folks often really have a pretty strong idea of like just kind of an intuitive sense of if that's true for them or not, if they are carrying something that's not theirs or not. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about transgenerational trauma later. And if indeed there are I mean, we all have, we all carry impact from our family, positive, negative, right? It's, we all carry that. But if indeed there are more significant impacts than kind of your garden variety, if there is um, a history of rape or sexual abuse or uh, perpetration in the family line, um, then we address it. And there's various ways that, that I work with that. Um, but it's, it's definitely considered when I think about it, it's a it's a huge piece of like you're saying this. Our ancestors are in our bodies; they are mm -hmm. us, and so it's almost malpractice, I would say, to not consider the impact of ancestry and our ancestors. Not and not just the ancestors that we knew, like the names of, but like even you know three, four, five generations back of their experiences with sexuality on our experience of sexuality. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. That's a, that's nice to, to answer that question. I'm curious of how you connect ancestors and the erotic. Well, um, people tend to think of their ancestors as disconnected from or disapproving of the erotic and add to that the fact that many folks have suffered sexual abuse in their family of origin. Uh, but sex and building capacity to enjoy and expand sexual energy. It, it's part of our ancestral wisdom. When you look at ancient and indigenous cultures around the world, you see that they, they honor sexual energy as sacred. You know, even though in our culture, this, this separation of sex and spirit is, is part of the, the trauma and oppression that we come from, sex and spirit are characterizes opposite forces and many of us unconsciously internalize that that idea and imagine that that um, sex is lower and spirit is higher sex is physical spirits ethereal but by looking at the the ancestors like wherever we are indigenous we can probably find some way that they celebrated the erotic and claimed the life force energy of the erotic and reclaiming 
the erotic from the the culturally imposed separation of of sex and spirit i think it it it's so liberating to to know that our physical and emotional experiences of erotic pleasure can really guide us to to know spirit through ourselves it's beautiful i love the way you reconnect those things and just appreciate the acknowledgement that they are disconnected culturally but that they they really aren't would you um you know you are a brilliant and profound teacher of the erotic and um, of helping people be in their bodies and in their pleasure. I'm just wondering if you'd be willing to uh, guide a practice, a somatic erotic practice, something that folks can do along now or later at home. Mm, thanks, Bhavani. Well, I could, I could suggest something. Yeah, that. Um, Let's see. Yeah, just maybe invite people who are listening, if you're in a safe place to do a, a visualization, that you could imagine, you could feel your connection with the earth and really tune in to your, your body, Tune in to your breath and visualize that you're a breathing volcano, that you're alive and vital, but massive and unmoving. Just feel yourself being completely what you are, a centered, grounded presence. Just feel how the weather flows over you. The people come and look at you or look away from you. And you might, you just sit there, this mountain with a genital generator inside you, quiet and smoldering. So just tuning in with your breath, with your awareness. Maybe if it feels right, putting a hand on the outside of your genitals to help you tune in to the genital generator and just feeling the flash of energy of movement or tingling liquefaction warm within you so experience the sweetness of the invisible inner fire moment by moment it's always changing yet always just being itself and just breathe into that and just feel how the volcano's magnificence and beauty aren't changed one bit by the weather or the passage of days. It's there whether people see it or not. And that fire within is going to erupt only when it's ready and not before. Not one minute before. I'll just breathe into that fire within. And when you're ready, just coming back into the everyday world, maybe with a little more sense of that yummy fire inside. Mm, that was lovely. Thank you, Kevin. <sighs> I want to change gears a little bit and ask you, you know, what's your take on healing transgenerational trauma? Like, how do we do that? Well, um, can you define transgenerational trauma? And tell me something about how you work with it, Pavani. I tend to think about healing going into the future rather than going into the past. I don't know if this is an official definition, but this is how I'm working with it. Okay. Um, that transgenerational trauma is, um, it's when someone has traumatic symptomology that from a trauma that they didn't experience. So the descendants of someone are experiencing traumatic symptoms when they themselves didn't ever experience the original traumatic events. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so like, basically there are changes, epigenetic changes happen, uh, 
you know, in our, to our genome when, when traumatic events happen. And certain genes, either the markers for those genes either get turned on or turned off, right? And so that can be passed down for up to four generations. So um, there's been a lot of work done with Holocaust survivors and the, the descendants of survivors, right, of looking at what are the expressed trauma symptoms that um, children and grandchildren of holo- people who are who are victimized in the Holocaust who never experienced those original traumas, uh, but then the the descendants are expressing. And so some of that's passed down through the culture of the family and, and through behaviors and beliefs, but some of it's passed down genetically. And in terms of transgenerational trauma, I think just another thing that's important to say is that much of it's passed through silence like when the stories aren't told Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. and that that's that like we, we have a sense that there's something there. We know that there's some, something, there's some secret or something that's not said. And so it's, it's just as much passed in the silence as it is through the behaviors, the beliefs or the biology. And there's loyalty to it, right? There can be loyalty to these uh, two traumatic um, symptoms because they are, let's say we're loyal to the suffering of our families. So when when I'm working with transgenerational trauma, I'm looking to first be able to see it and acknowledge it, right? So when things haven't been acknowledged, when they haven't been spoken out loud, they can't be healed until they are seen and, and spoken. And folks, like I said before, often have a really strong sense of if that's true, like they might have, for example, they might have a pain in a part of their body um, that's recurrent and there's no medical explanation for it. And, you know, come to find out that their grandfather had a wound in the war or or died from a wound in the war in that same part of the body, right? Mm -hmm. Um, There's things like anniversary syndrome where trauma survivors have, you know, accidents on the same day or uh, the same year of their life or the same season that their ancestors did. And basically it's like the trauma wants to heal, the wound wants to heal, right? And so there's all these expressions of it so that it can heal. So first seeing, acknowledging it, um, asking the questions like, is this mine? How do I know? where did I get it or where did I learn it? Um, And then healing it through different practices and the acknowledgement of it is pretty much how I work with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just because we can't, yeah, we can't change our behavior until we can see it. We don't have any choice. Right. So does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I've tried to talk a bit about that in my book, uh, the science for sexual happiness, how neuroscience has shown that touch induced trauma and, touch neglect to create epigenetic changes that have an impact on gene expression through life and reach into future generations. So yeah, we embody the the trauma of our ancestors and the trauma induced by our environments. So we haven't really talked about that, that, you know, the the societal toxins around sex, the disempowerment and trauma that um, the punishments for every sexual transgression of anything but the most restrictive paradigms uh, for sexual expression and the, the violence of gender norms and, uh, and gender designations that we live with from day to day, those kind of the trauma of the dominant culture and uh, the chronic developmental trauma, also neglect has as profound effects as as trauma so as you're saying about the silence uh, having such a profound effect also like the lack of of touch and the the um, not being met has as profound an epigenetic effect as shock traumas right like trauma can be one event or it can be a series of events where it can be um, like you're saying a toxic environment or a system of oppression, right? Like mm-hmm. those can all, they can all create trauma in the body. Um, so what do we do about it? Like, what do we do once like, cause obviously we're all the recipients of some of this stuff culturally, right? And some of us more so than others in terms of oppression, some of us more so than others in terms of, you know, intense experiences well, I think that, you know, that's the hope, the understanding that somatics and neuroplasticity offer that 
that though where trauma happens and we're we're hurt profoundly hurt by personal and cultural forces, but also that that we're resilient and we're courageous and we can actually change. So that you know when we start doing things differently, when we start finding the care, the uh, help, the the cherishment, the belonging, when we can uh, establish connections within the self and with others and community and the world of nature and spirit and with our own body, then we can actually heal and metabolize this, this ancestral pain and, and, and find ways to resist and unwind the dominant culture of sex. I love that statement, resist and unwind the dominant culture of sex. <laughs> I want a bumper sticker that says that. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the neurologically, how do you work with trauma? How do you work with your nervous system to unwind trauma? Like what are you actually doing or looking for? So um, yeah, there's, there's the two different ways. One is cultivating awareness of body sensations. So feelings that originate in the brain stem rather than the cerebral cortex. So as I was doing with that uh, volcano meditation, encouraging the awareness of body, the cascade of sensation in the body, this helps people to heal. So that's like interoception or, or top-down brain into the body kind of awareness that's part of of somatics. And then there's the bottom up or body speaking to brain. So the nervous system actually reorganizes itself as we practice new ways of breathing and moving and engaging with touch. So as people learn to to feel and trust and follow their their inner impulse to pleasure and happiness and aliveness and to retreat from what's wrong with them as they learn to to self-regulate unconscious processes and ways that the body's holding on to trauma. And that can be like with breath coaching, with uh, movement, and, um, and with touch experiences. Like I think uh, touch experiences are, are very profound. It's like the body's first way of learning and of organizing the nervous system, uh, both um, when you think about the the development of multicellular life touches like like the primary sense and then our individual lives as well. So simple touch uh, exercises. Here's here's one that people can do at home of of setting aside some time and space for a, a touch ritual. Create a touch ritual with a a friend or a, a partner or um, someone trustworthy that you can uh, arrange a, a time, a set time, say 15 minutes, to experience them, say, touching you on the genitals and the heart, and just be aware of what sensations, what emotions arise, or, or it could be numbness that arises. And just by, by being touched in this careful, contained way, then you can be supported in in feeling and in um, accessing this cellular intelligence, this this awareness of of body sensation and the impulse to pleasure with within us. You know, and people can also do that alone, of course, with with just touching their their genitals and their their heart if they don't have a a friend or or a, trustworthy person that they can do that with. Yeah, I think that that's, you're talking about non-sexual touch too. You're not talking about like a sexual experience. You're talking about like, what is it like to just have your heart and your genitals held and what, what happens for you, right? Yes, well, that's, you know, that's the, the beauty of working with a somatic sex educator is that there's not a, a set pattern of, of what what touch means you get to just discover and to be curious and to to uncover what it means to you so um yeah i, I really suggest that people separate this kind of experience from their usual patterns of of sexual experience so yes to to create a, a ritual outside of any sexual connection or 
or script uh, to just feel like like what is there and um, our cells hold hold memories that often as you say go back through generations and stuff can arise maybe not in the form of specific memories but but in the form of sensations and emotions that uh, are there within us that we just so often are trained or or acculturated to to not pay attention to one of the key skills in in my opinion of working with ancestors is about learning how to set boundaries like and especially when there's been if it's an ancestor where there has been sexual harm or any kind of harm that's been done like I don't want to necessarily work directly with that ancestor, right? I don't want to have a relationship directly with that ancestor. So I have to learn to set boundaries and people often trip out about this. Like what you can like set boundaries with the ancestors. Like, well, yeah, right. They're just people. And when I hear you talking about touch and as a way to um, re-regulate the nervous system after trauma, I'm thinking that, that that's also a place where we relearn boundaries, right? And that boundaries are the thing that help us feel safe. And I just wonder if you would speak a little bit to that. Well, I think that, you know, that's such a, a key to this work of like to, to know that our boundaries are, are eroded by inattention and bullying and neglect and unwanted touch. And, and we're really trained to en- endure unwanted touch people are a lot more comfortable often enduring whatever happens than they are in asking for what they want. So it's, it's very foundational to, to feel into what, what you want and be, to learn to trust that, to learn to express it, to be able to be met, to, to feel and empowered in your no and your, your yes and you're changing your mind. So yes it, it's absolutely key and it's just something that well you know we just don't get a lot of training in or practice in and uh what i just feel so passionate about the role that that we can as as somatic sex educators to to bring that experience of empowering choice and voice into people's lives just feeling a lot of joy listening to you say that. And also just that, that new connection that I just made through listening to you about like, oh, right, it's a, say, it's a transferable skill, right? Like learning, learning to say yes and learning to say no are my boundaries. And then it's the same with my ancestors. Like there's, it's the same, mm-hmm. right? My body, my ancestors. Um, you have a new book out that you co-edited. Uh, that's the Healers on the Edge book. And I would love to hear you speak about the content of that book. Oh, thank you. Yes, Pavanina. I'm excited about it. It's the first anthology that introduces and explains somatic sex education. So what we've been talking about, about using the, the wisdom of the body to help heal physical, emotional, and psychological wounds. So yeah, there's people that, that write about many, the many dimensions of our work, um, empowering choice and voice being such a a key one. There's there's contributions from clients uh, who talk about uh, how they have been met by the work, and um, there's a section on on focusing on healing trauma. There's one on pelvic pain. There's there's authors who focus on the broad implications of unwinding the bondage of patriarchy in the body and the cultural importance of this doing this work. Yes, and and there's uh, yeah the other people who focus on working with porn addiction, working with disability, making making our work yeah, the difference between working with as individually and in workshops and uh, working with uh, the gender galaxy. So yeah, it's it's an exciting book, uh, the first of hopefully many anthologies on this uh, on this field. And is it available on Amazon? Yes, it is. Okay, great. So that's Healers on the Edge. 
Uh, and it's available on Amazon. One of two exciting books out this month on somatic sex education, right? The other one, yes, Christian, Christian Thomas. I, has, yeah, read your beautiful, beautiful um, blurb about. So that's great. Yeah, great. Christian Thomas has a has a book on on trauma, a handbook for somatic sex educators, on uh, working with body and soul. So I'm I'm so excited that that. Uh, this is coming into the world and yeah, it feels like our profession is really stepping up to yeah, a new visibility. Well, you have a couple of upcoming trainings that I just wanted to give a shout out to um, in case folks feel really inspired um, by listening to you and would like to further their connection with you. Um, you have a trauma training for bodywork professionals, which is super cool. Uh, coming up in England uh, later this month, uh, the C School of Embodiment. Um, that sounds wonderful. And then you also are doing um, a refresher course for sexological body workers uh, on Salt Spring Island in August. Do you want to say anything about either of those, or do you want me to just sure. give the? Well, well yeah? um, okay. They they're both um, sort of trainings for people that are involved in some way in in this work. So um, uh, sort of professional development pieces. And uh, I'm so excited to be working with Katie Sarah in England, and who, who also specializes in working with healing trauma. And um, they have a, a beautiful place there, I guess, in on the sea in in uh, southwest England. And uh, yeah, to to uh, we're we're creating this professional development thing where we'll talk about the you know how how this how it works and how we work and assessment and and working as safely as we can with uh, people who who are have experienced sexual abuse and uh, the step by step process and then uh, the august one is is a joyful collegial kind of gathering at my studio which is also on the sea on salt spring island and uh, it's like a camp out People uh, stay here, and um, and we co-learn and share our um, wisdoms, and uh, it's uh, it's a lovely, lovely workshop. And then in the fall, I have ones for people that are are new to the field, so um, people that want to integrate some of these ideas into their personal lives, or that are interested in in uh, beginning to learn to how to work as a somatic sex educator. Great. Thank you so much for doing that work and making it available. Um, and if folks want to get more information about that, you can check it out on Caffin's website, which again is www.aerospirit.ca, E-R-O-S-P-I-R-I-T dot C-A. And Caffin, I am so grateful to be able to spend this time with you and uh, listen to you and, and share wisdom with you. It's such a delight. So thank you. Oh, I, I feel so grateful for the time with you, Pavani, and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I so, so admire your presence and your work. So it's exciting to have a, a chance to talk with you. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening to this episode of Bespoken Bones, and I'm Pavani Moray, and I'll be back every full and new moon with more embodied goodness and ancestral wisdom. Take care. Bye.